Musician Podcast with creator and host Nomad. With 20 plus years of experience in the music industry, Nomad has done just about everything to earn a living as a career musician. From being music director to celebrity artists, playing iconic arenas and stadiums, composing for film and TV, and even playing your average local club gigs, he's done it all. Nomad's mission is to empower musicians across the globe with strategies for a sustainable career while blasting stereotypes, and to bring you tried and true wisdom from his colleagues in this crazy business we call music. On this episode of TCM, another good friend of mine, Mr. John Stoddard, piano player extraordinaire, composer, producer, singer-songwriter. Let me tell you, this dude does it all. I freaking love John's voice, and I love his writing, his production skills, everything. And he's worked with the likes of Celine Dion, Michael McDonald, Sandy Patty, Boney James, Al Jarreau, Will Downing, Take Six, Patty Austin, and Kirk Whalum, just to name a few. Now, John and I met while we were both working with Kirk Whalum. And let me tell you, if you have not heard John and Kirk do their thing on a solo saxophone and piano performance, you are missing out. You're going to want to check them out. Not to mention the fact that you also need to check out John's discography of his own as an artist in his own right. Right here, John Stoddard on the Career Musician Podcast. On this episode of the Career Musician Podcast, I have a dear, dear friend of mine. We've been friends for over years, uh, <laughs> a.k.a. lots of years. Lots of uh, years. <laughs> we go way back. Mr. John Stoddart, welcome to TCM, bro. Man, what an honor to be here. I've been following along with some of the other episodes, taking notes, learning stuff, so I'm, I'm honored to actually be here. Oh, well, thank you. I, I think you you probably know most of the stuff already. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> you know, never, stop, never stop learning, man. Never stop learning. <laughs> man, I couldn't agree with that more. I just spent the past four hours learning stuff on YouTube today. My brain right. is fried, you know? <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it takes a little longer for it to hold information these days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So John and I go way back to the Kirk Whalum days. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, for those listeners who might not know who Kirk Whalum is, uh, an amazing jazz, gospel, soul, R&B, saxophonist, composer, musician, and um, pastor, I believe, uh, mm -hmm. you know, theologian, basically. Uh, right. Just a really good man, good spirit. Um, I auditioned for Kirk's band years and years ago in, in the late 90s, I believe, 99 mm -hmm. maybe, and mm -hmm. I got the gig, and then you came to the band. If I joined in 99, I think you might have come to the band a couple of years after that. Yeah, that right? because I was doing like duo dates with him, but in terms of okay. playing with the band, it might have been a little after that, 2000 or 01 or something like that, yeah. So right around the same time, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. we were in that realm. And right. now, if I'm not mistaken, you you still work quite a bit with Kirk. Is that right? I do. I, I've been working as his musical director for, uh, what, what did you, you put your hand over your mouth when you were yeah. counting the years? <laughs> <laughs> for, uh, for a little while, a um, little while now, I still you know, tour with him uh, and collaborate with him from a production standpoint and arranging mm -hmm. and so on. So, yeah, we work together a lot. Right. I was going to say, because you have co-produced quite a bit of projects with him. Yeah. I mean, probably every record with the exception of maybe two in the last 20 years, maybe. That's amazing. So yeah. first two of all. Two or three. Yeah. Not very many. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But still, it's, a, it's amazing to find that kind of synergy, right? With, yeah. With mm -hmm. another, you know, musical being. 
Right. But it's an amazing relationship to have that with an artist as the co-producer and music director to have right. that kind of longevity yeah. and that open communication, the, the understanding, the mutual respect. That's that's a, that's a gift. Yeah, uh, most people working together for that long have either like tried to kill each other or. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we give each other plenty of space, but yeah, we've traveled around the world together, man. And uh, I, I think we have so much respect for each other. And um, it's just, like you say, the musical synergy was just there from the first note that we played together. And uh, it's just been great. I still, as, as fulfilling today for me as it was those first couple of gigs that we, get, that we did together all those years ago. So yeah, it's wow. a real honor to still be working with him, you know? That, that's amazing, man. That's so yeah. cool. So, sorry, I jumped right into that. I totally bypassed the first topic, which is usually getting to know our guests. So. Right. <laughs> All right, now that we got that out of the way, let's get to know John. <laughs> right. So, uh, like I said, John and I have worked together with Kirk, but also on lots of albums together. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You've brought me in to play guitar on so many albums that you've produced, right. including your own. Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to talk about you as an artist, but I want to start from the beginning. So give us a brief history. I know, by the mm -hmm. way, folks, you can go to Wikipedia and check out John Stoddard's page there. And of mm -hmm. course, you can check out his, uh, his website, um, mm -hmm. which is just johnstoddard.com. American R&B gospel singer, songwriter, grew up singing in church. Take it away, right. John. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, I mean, that's probably a lot of people's story. Um, I think maybe where my story gets unique is... Uh, I started out as a singer, like really young, like maybe three, two, three years old. And I just hated it. I hated it. You know, I was like in church and, you know, they'd ask me to sing these songs and I just, I was shy. I was like, ah. So when I such started a good singer. Oh That's man, crazy. I still, I still get kind of shy about it. But when I started playing the piano, I was like, great, this is my out. So I started playing the piano, you know, three, four or five years old. And I was like, great, I never have to sing again. And so I probably didn't sing again till high school, you know? Um, but I loved all kind of music. You know, my dad introduced me to a lot of, of course, like you say, grew up listening to gospel and sort of church music, religious music. Um, but even my religious exposure, I think was kind of broad because it wasn't just sort of traditional gospel, but, you know, I grew up Seventh-day Adventist, and that musical tradition is so diverse. I mean, everything from Whitley Phipps to Take Six to the Breath of Life Quartet to orchestras to, I mean, it's just acapella stuff to you name it, and you can find it in that tradition. Um, and so I had that. I had, um, I was studying classical piano, which I love. So I, right. I did that pretty much all the way through college. So I love the classical thing. Um, big band, a um, lot of uh, um, uh, contemporary classical stuff like uh, the, the, I was really into the um, the 20th century classical composer. So I had that wow. and I loved watching, get this, this is probably going to come as a surprise to a lot of people. I loved musicals. Like I never Martin, knew that about you. Yeah. Dude, Martin and Lewis and Danny wow. K. Bing Crosby, all that stuff. So that really influenced a lot of um, how I hear music and the stuff that I like. So um, in high school, started playing pipe organ, um, but also got introduced to artists like Sting and David Foster. And so I, all this sort of musical gumbo, if we could call it. Yeah. <laughs> my, my wife calls it clean out the refrigerator suit. So my musical <laughs> clean out the refrigerator suit had all these different influences and um and so i think it all just leaks out even still now to this day in the music that i, I love and the music that i do it's incredible man because i i always called you like the uh herbie hancock chopin amalgamation <laughs> you, know? it's like, you have these ridiculous chops that are so diverse like you just mentioned I love mm. your classical sensibilities. I love your R&B sensibilities. I love your jazz sensibilities. And, and mm. now it makes sense to know more about your background. Mm. Um, and like you said, the Adventist, uh, 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 I guess the musical culture of the yeah. Seventh-day Adventist mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. so diverse. Oh, my goodness. It's really and, amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't know that. Um, but I learned more about it by hanging with you. That's, yeah, yeah. that's incredible, man. Let yeah, me ask you yeah, this. It's... Have you ever gotten overwhelmed with musical versatility to where you feel like, oh man, how do I 
compartmentalize all these different things that I do? Or? Yeah, I think you do. Um, it, it can be a challenge sometimes because, uh, you know, commercially trying to be a musician, um, well, that's not true. Trying to be an artist maybe is more difficult being diverse, you know, you being a musician, just as long as you, I think, as you honor each tradition, you know. So, for example, I, I don't do as much classical as I as I um, used to or like as much pipe organ as I used to. So somebody said, oh, I love your pipe organ. Why don't you do a pipe organ record? And I kind of go, I, I mean, I appreciate that. I, I, I receive that compliment. But I know people who are spending five and six to seven hours a day practicing the organ. Wow. So, you know, I, I have so much respect for what it takes to really do that at the highest level that, you know, I, I do my best to when I'm doing something to either be able to put in the time to really do it with excellence um, and the type of excellence that I know it's right, even if the audience doesn't know it's, you know, right. Man. Um, and that, that's just really important to me. And again, I, I just, I know and have and respect so many great musicians that I just think it's important that, you know, we honor the time it takes to not just do music, but to do a particular type of music that's right. really, really well. So I tend to more live in this sort of production, contemporary jazz, R&B, sort of Christian pop, adult world that still sounded yeah. like 12, 12 things but it's <laughs> <laughs> but it's and the, it right? actually comes together really nicely it really does one of the things i always admired yeah. about you and when we were on the road together it used to like it, I was always saying to myself, man, I wish I could do that. You were always singing riffs. We'd be walking in the airport, <laughs> and here's John. He'd be like, whoa, 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 just singing a riff. And, and then all of a sudden, he sings some melody, uh, some lyrics, and then you're like, wait, what's that, John? Oh, it's a song I wrote. And I was just like, this guy's always singing, <laughs> which well, I thought was amazing. Dude, the running joke in my house is like, if somebody broke in in the middle of the night and we were all hiding we would be found because I cannot help humming. <laughs> They're like, we, we wouldn't be able to hide in the house because I just, I mean, in the bathroom, uh, my kids, they tease me about it all the time. They're like, he's always humming. So I love that, it's a, man. It's a, it's a blessing and a curse. <laughs> I think it's awesome. That's why you said you weren't, you weren't too fond of singing in the beginning. I, that's a big surprise, you know? Right, right. Not, well, not in public. Like, right. it's, I think it gotcha. was the getting in front of the audience it's still as a singer, I don't know, I feel kind of naked. I, I feel much more comfortable. I do it, you know, now you learn how to do it. Mm -hmm. But I definitely feel more comfortable if I'm sitting at the piano, even right. if I'm the solo artist. You know, it just kind of feels like home for me. Oh, man, I'm the same way. I don't want to sing without a guitar in my hand. Without a guitar? Okay, so yeah. you understand. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I'm not even like half the technical singer that you are. Oh, but, whatever. But whatever. still, I have to have that instrument. You know, and I think it's yeah. if, if whatever your primary instrument is, you know, that yeah. just makes yeah. sense. Yeah. yeah, it does. It, I just feel more comfortable with, with sitting at the piano. So Absolutely. All right. So, <laughs> so talking about all these influences... Mm -hmm. Let's shift gears to your solo career for a minute. Okay. You've released how many albums thus far as an artist? So I have, let's see, one, two, three, probably about five or six. Is it one, two, three, four, five? And then a okay. Christmas album, maybe six and a Christmas, either five and a Christmas or six and a Christmas. Christmas. I, I lose okay. count sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, it's really cool because there's a delicate balance between juggling a... Um, a hired gun career yep. and an mm -hmm. artist career, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that and tell us about yeah. your experiences with that. I don't know that I've mastered the balance of that yet. <laughs> I probably I probably should be doing uh, more solo stuff. Um, you know, we talked about the difference between being a really uh, well-versed and broad uh, sideman or musician as opposed to being an artist who has who does a bunch of different things. Um, I think the part of me that enjoys doing a lot of different things uh, may tend to take precedence because as a producer arranger, I get to do that. You know, one day I'm doing some orchestra stuff and the next day I'm playing, uh, you know, a piano track for, you know, a soul country singer or something. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? 
So that's tough to do as an artist, but as a producer or as an arranger, you know, it's just every day is this completely new thing. Um, so I, I probably should be doing more solo stuff, um, but I, I got to have to get better at that. Yeah. Well, do you have yeah. plans on, on working at something, you know, coming up soon? You know, I do. You know, I'm working on a project that I did. Actually, you played on this project. We did uh, a live sort of in-studio recording in Nashville. I remember that. And do you remember that? So I'm on the back end of sort of finishing that and overdubbing it. I think I've got like one more song. Again, trying to find the time in between all the, you know, right. 10,000 things we have going on. Sometimes for whatever reason, as artists who are also producers, we tend yes. to back burner our solo stuff. You know, you gotta like, it's so hard to make Man. it a priority. I don't know why. <laughs> no truer words have been spoken. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to make it a priority. I have to say quarantine has helped me prioritize my solo career, my, my band ah. career. And, and uh, okay. it's, been a, it's been a great blessing to have all this time you know yeah uh, because true. it takes time just <laughs> you know you have not to only produce does it, it not only does it take time but I, I tell people it takes what i call fallow time f-a-l-l-o-w in other words you know music to me like inspiration needs space to happen mm -hmm. you know what i mean at least for me you know that may yes. not be the case with everybody but yes. i mean you kind of like have to be able to sit still sometime or like to be able to process or think you know when you're writing and when you're moving a thousand miles an hour like I, i'm so impressed with people who can like be on tour and they're working on a new album and they're producing this artist and you know people like marcus miller who's like dude how are you doing like 12 records at a time and then you're on tour and then you're doing your new record and you got a yeah. movie that you're producing some people can do it i, I gotta have like i gotta like go sit out by the lake with some grapes you know, I just, <laughs> I just need time. Uh, yes. To, you know what I mean? I just I need time. I agree. Well, I think that time, I've, by the way, I looked up the definition. Great word, fallow. <laughs> Plowed and left unseated for a season or more, uncultivated, you know, uh, yeah. it's a farming technique. And I like the, yeah. the parallel that you drew. That's really nice. Mm -hmm, Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, I, I need fallow time. Yeah. Well, I think, I think everybody does because I think, first of all, when we look on the, from the outside, when we look at those artists that do seem to be doing a lot, chances are they have a team that's helping them facilitate that's, a lot of that's true. aspects of the, you know, a lot of variables of the equation. And mm -hmm. then also I do believe like somebody, Marcus Miller, great example. I'm sure he doesn't just go in the studio and write and record 10 songs in three days. I'm sure right. he's been sitting with those songs for a while prior. That's you know what I mean? Point. That's, that's a good point. That's probably true. That's I think it's a true. process, you know? And uh, yeah. I, I I find that even myself, whether it's this podcast or launching my my band career with my wife or uh, a project that I'm working on, if I can hire some interns to help with some of the daily you know day to day, boy, that makes all the difference in the world. So you know? here's a question for you then: with interns or people or even even colleagues that yeah, help assistance colleagues yeah. yeah is it is it hard to let go though like are you like kind of a control guy or like me like wait a minute that 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 what kind of pay, what what number of pencil are you using no. i always use a, i always use a number two, two. <laughs> <laughs> don't take my notes with that number one pencil <laughs> i can see your erase marks <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, I, I think, think that's that's the hard part. I think when I think about people like that, Marcus and um, you know Quincy Jones and people, right. fought David Foster. Right. You have to get to the point where your team building skills are mm -hmm. really good, and you're able to attract really great talent, and you're able to let go and sort of appreciate the fact that this is probably not going to be exactly the way it would be if I were to do it all myself but it's still going to be great. That's, yes. that's hard. That's hard for me. I, that's another one of those things I'm working on that and doing solo projects and letting yeah. go. <laughs> well, Hey, it's taken me a long time to learn how to be an effective team leader. And like you said, I'm still learning every day. I have a, mm -hmm. a, a wonderful team now for the podcast here and i'm very grateful for all my members big shouts out to eric and charlie and lola <laughs> uh they have been fantastic but yes uh, in the, especially in the beginning to let go it takes some time but okay. as you as you develop a workflow uh mm -hmm. 
then it becomes easier. And there's so many different apps and platforms now that are available. You know, we, for collaborating we, and so on. Yeah, we use Slack uh, to communicate. You know, uh, we use Trello for all of our uh, workflow to do lists. You know, okay. and then of course you have Zoom, so we have conferences once a week. You know, um, again, I, I like to try to implement all of the tools that are available because I love. Just like you, I know you're a gadget guy too. Yeah, I'm a gadget guy. I'm a gadget. Yeah, you and I, I like talked like, about that. I like the tech. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it helps. It, it really does help. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. you know. But yes, there is a process of letting go, and, and then still, I, I'm a big QC component. You have to have quality control. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Because it has to be. Yeah, the more hands it goes through, looking at it, the better. Right. Ah. Uh, okay. Okay. All right. That being okay. said. Just yesterday, we had an emergency where <laughs> one of the episodes had a snippet of the wrong audio in it from another episode. Uh, oh, so my goodness. <laughs> we, I get on Slack. I'm blowing the team up. Guys, guys, emergency, emergency. You know, delete everything. Delete everything. <laughs> My point is, like, it's not like without bells and whistles. Yeah. Bells and whistles going off, you know, yeah. sirens. Exactly, it's not without huge fails. But we we all know to succeed, you have to fail. So you have to fail. That's part of it. That's part of the process for sure. Part right, of the process. Right. <laughs> Man, okay. So um, actually, this is a good point. During quarantine, uh, there's no touring. Mm -hmm. So what has been keeping right. you busy? So I've been doing a lot of producing and arranging. Um, uh, uh, actually a lot of indie projects, you know, when I started working in the music industry, a lot of the artists that I was working with and probably still, uh, 40% maybe of the artists that I work with now are not full-time musicians. They're people who do music for the fun of it or for the love of it. And they may have another full-time career, but you know, they've always loved music and they've got some talent, they've got some interest. And so they want to either do a record or do a song or still be involved. Um, so I've done this year maybe two or three records, like whole records like that, where it's just an artist. I had one friend of mine. She worked in the industry for a long time um, as a session singer. And she got married and raised a family and like tw never did a solo record. So here, you know, her I think her oldest son is 21 or 22 now. And she says, I think I'm ready to do my first solo project. So I a and would that record with her. You know, we found some great songs, produced it. Um, and so I've done a couple of projects like that, a few label things. Uh, there's a producer uh, who does a lot in the gospel realm by the name of Aaron Lindsay, really, really right. great gospel producer. So yep. uh, I do no, a lot Aaron. of work. You know, Aaron, right? Right. So I do a lot of orchestration, uh, MIDI orchestration for Aaron. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So I've yeah. done a couple of things for that. So and then, you know, just the usual, um, you know, uh, online video performance here, you know, recording there. Um, right. I think uh, about two weeks ago, we did a uh, for Women's Day, get this, for Metro FM in South Africa, one of the, probably the largest R&B station in South Africa. Shout out to anybody who may be listening from, uh, from nice. uh, South yes. Africa. Yes, uh, They have just, that, that country has been, aside from the U.S., has probably been the biggest supporter of my music for the past 20 years. Wow. So we did a, we did a, a live performance for them uh, uh, over the air for their Women's Day or Women's Month celebration. So oh, that's cool. Yeah, you know, it's just a, a combination of things that you kind of do to keep the keep the the, the wheels turning. The wheels so to turning. Speak, during, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, let's mm -hmm. let's unpack the the uh, production for indie artists. Okay. Uh, because I know a lot of people like to you know would like to get into that more, especially you know okay. maybe our younger aspiring producers. Uh, by yeah. the way, once again, thank you for calling me on some of those projects. I do yes. appreciate that. <laughs> Uh, well, wonderful okay. projects, I, by the way. Thank, thank you, and you've done yeah. great, great work. The stuff that the clients are happy. So, oh man, yeah, yes. Well, As, and I got a, I got a great compliment the other day because one of my demos, uh, I got a, a guitar demos, I got a compliment on, and the uh, from Tony Shepard. You know, he's a mutual friend of ours. He That's said, right. he said, who, who did that guitar? And I said, man, that was my best Michael Rapol MIDI <laughs> guitar impersonation. <laughs> I said, it's just waiting for his live track. I said, but it's a, it's the best I could do, you know, with, without having him here, 
in that's the hilarious so. <laughs> and i think i told you the same thing when john sends me uh, like you said you send me the tracks with a demo a faux guitar i call it right uh-huh. <laughs> and i called him up i'm like john what the hell you need me for, man? You just crushed the guitar part. You killed, like, okay. You put it in a mix. You put some effects. You can't tell. <laughs> Dude, I can tell. I can tell. I have to have Nomad on my uh, record. So I'm just oh, saying. Thank I'm you, just man. saying. It makes, so it makes all the difference. It makes all the difference. <laughs> well, I love collaborating with you, man. I mean, it's so fun. It's yes. so fun, you Incredible. know, getting to, because there's some stuff that you sent me, some Christmas stuff, you know, yes. last year that we got a yes. chance to work on together. And it was cool for me as a producer because usually I'm sending you stuff. That might have been right. maybe one of the first times you started the production and sent it to me. And it was um, just as much fun, but like in a different way, you know. And I, mean? I was just so. going to say that. And here's the thing: I love a- about a great orchestrator arranger. When I gave you those, because I just gave him some bare rhythm tracks, man, you made it sound like a sixty-piece orchestra. It was insane wow. what you did, wow. you know. And wow. that to me is such a different animal from where I come from. But I'm so mm-hmm. intrigued by it. So yeah. you know, I'm studying orchestration constantly. Uh, mm-hmm. and, but I, you know, to, for somebody like you who just has it naturally, um, obviously you've been doing it for some time. Right. Anyway, we make a great team is the point, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> as as uh, Everett Harp used to say, mutual admiration society. The so mutual <laughs> admiration society. That is an Everett quote. <laughs> yeah, isn't it? Yeah, and he wrote a song a, about it. Yeah. <laughs> did he really? I didn't yeah. know that. <laughs> that song, that's, that's how I remember that. Anyway, okay. Shout out to all of our friends. But okay, so unpacking the concept of being an indie producer, um, mm-hmm. You know, there's a whole process to it. And you said, a key, you made a key statement, you're a ring So for those mm-hmm. who don't know, that's artists and repertoire. Uh, it's mm-hmm. an old industry term. And mm-hmm. I, it really starts there because you have to have, first, you have to have a relationship with the artist. You have to cultivate right. some kind right. of a vibe, right? Mm-hmm. 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 Then you have to help them build the vision, which is the A&R process. Right. 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 And then you have to produce the music. So... You know, talk to us about that. Well, I'll use my one friend. Uh, her name is Sonia. I don't think she would mind us uh, calling her. Her record is yes. really coming out really great. But um, it was interesting for Sonia, this process, because it probably took us maybe two, two and a half years. Mm. Because she knew she wanted to do a project. She had experience in the studio. She had, you know, worked as like a party band singer for a long time. When I met her, that's what she was doing. So she was used to singing other people's music. Mm-hmm. She sang in a cover band, but that gave her a lot of experience, but it also made it difficult for her to know who she was as an artist because she was sort of really used to as a background singer, just morphing into what the producer needed for the record, you know, for whatever record they were producing at the time. So we really took some time, you know, we tried a couple of things. She had a, some ideas of what she wanted to do. Um, you know, we found a couple of songs that we liked and, you know, she tried recording them. A couple of them worked, a couple of them didn't. Mm. And we ended up writing a few new things. She had some um, germs of some ideas, you know, some uh, sparks of ideas that we developed. And, um, <clears throat> and we just took our time. And I think she was happy at the end of the process because there's this sort of anxiousness about, man, I'm so excited. This is especially when it's your first record. Oh, man, I'm, I'm right. going to do my record. I'm excited about it. But if you take that time to just develop and figure what works, it's kind of like I tell people I, I use this example. It's like like you walk by Zara. It's like one of my favorite stores and you see right. something in the window and you go like, oh, I love that outfit. I'm going to go get that. And then you go in the store and you try it on and you kind of go like, it doesn't quite look the same on me as I as it did in the window. But there might be something else that you looked at in the window and be like, that's ah, not my favorite. But while I'm here, I'll try it on. You try that on and it's like, man, this fits great. I would have never thought. I, I like the other one looking at it in the window. I go. think the same yeah. thing happens with singers. It's like I hear Layla Hathaway singing that song and I'm like, man, I want to do that song. And then I try to sing it and I go like, why don't I sound like Layla? It's because ah, you got to right. find the right thing. So that part of the process that you mentioned, I think it, it pays dividends down the road because um, you're not the singer and the song are not fighting against one another. They're sort of made for each other. So they fit, 
you know, production is hard enough as it is getting it right. If you've got, if you're trying to make a song fit on an artist that doesn't fit, it's just like trying to put on that Zara suit that looked great in the window, but it just doesn't fit, you know? So true. And, and once again, I like to um, present things to our aspiring, perhaps younger, up and coming audience. You have to have that relationship. You can't just DM somebody on Instagram or Facebook or whatever and right. be like, yo, let's work together. I got some beats, blah, blah, blah. Sure, you could do that, but you're not gonna have that chemistry that you're talking about. Yeah, so yeah. develop the relationship first. Yeah. Start throwing mm -hmm. ideas around, start talking about other music that they might like, you know, and the, mm -hmm. you know, right? Mutual common mutual common interest, perhaps. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Sharing uh, examples, you know, I tell people to share stuff. And uh, I don't really think there's any substitute for trying stuff. Like if you can find a way to, even if it's like a karaoke song, because a lot of times, again, people, their image of what they sound like is different than what they actually sound like. Right. You know, so you got to give people an opportunity to, especially early on, um, to try stuff, you know, so build that into your process. Let's try this song. Uh, when I was working with Sonia, there was a couple of songs that were like, it wasn't quite coming together and we changed the key. I said, you know, what if we took this song and raised it a half step? And it just like became a completely different song for her. It sat in her range yes. a lot better. So those are the types of things that you can't really rush through. You just have to just like you say, take your time and develop. That's right. Let's talk about one of my biggest challenges over the years, and I've gotten a lot better with it especially when you're producing somebody you know, <laughs> like your wife. <laughs> Let's talk about producing vocals, because okay. that is perhaps, in my opinion, one of the, one of the most important aspects. Like you yeah. said, you're pulling that performance out, but it's one of the most delicate processes. It is, uh, man, that, you're right. I, 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 I think it, man, where to even start with that? Yeah, um, right. <laughs> Uh, and I was going to say, I, well, I'll just say from my perspective, I think it helps me that I'm a singer. Mm -hmm. um, it really helps because when I get stuck, um, I can offer ideas, you know, but I, I know some really great vocal producers who really aren't singers. Like I work with this one, uh, he's a songwriter, really. And I've never had this happen. I don't even think I've had it happen since, but... He stood, literally, he'd written a song and he wanted to demo it. So I played the piano track and he said, hey, will you sing this song for me? Because he wasn't really a singer. So I'm singing it. He stood in front of me in the studio and like conducted me like I was a choir. Like it was just me and him. He was like giving me hand motions and stuff. It was, it was actually kind of strange, but it worked. He got what he wow. wanted because I was just kind of hit with, that was the way he communicated. Um, so yeah, I think... So there's no right or wrong way. Um, there's really. no really yeah. right or wrong way. You're trying to get it to to feel good. You know, the sort of hair raising up on your forearms. Right. Um, you know, depending on the style of music, you know, um, depending on the singer. Like, for example, I'll give you two examples of techniques that I use. If it's a really, really great singer, a lot of times I'll just cut them loose at first. Say, just go ahead and sing or sing yeah. two passes or three passes and then we'll begin crafting from there. Um, if it's a singer who maybe um, leans more on the production, you have to walk them through, okay, let's do this verse, let's work on it and get it you know, right, because it's my job as the producer to shape the song, so I really know how I want it to shape, how I want it to feel by the end, right. but I take different paths to get there depending on the singer that I'm working with and depending on the kind of song it is. You know, That right there is the value, that's it. And, mm -hmm. and and that's so important to remember, yes. So yeah, take yeah. take into consideration the type of singer you're working with and their yep. style and how they, you know, how, how their their production language, right? How, right, how, oh, how that, to, there you go, that's a good. <laughs> yeah, how to yeah. best get the message across, yeah. Yeah, that's I great. have another, I have another friend who also always teases me um, because uh, I, I'm probably diplomatic to a fault, maybe too <laughs> diplomatic. <laughs> So one of the things that I know because I'm a singer is how insecure most singers are. 
<laughs> that's so, so true. yeah and yeah. it's a it's a vulnerable thing man you're in there on this microphone there's like no reverb it's like no auto tune it's just you know you're just naked so i think another big part of that is providing frankly emotional support for that artist mm -hmm. hey man that was a really great take or if there's something that you want different or, or sung differently or done differently then you say you know maybe not man that really sucked let's just we're let's, you stop the tape let's just do that again that was horrible <laughs> that doesn't tend to build the morale <laughs> And I am guilty of that. You're guilty of that. With, with my no, wife no, no, especially. No, stop, stop, stop it, yeah. stop, stop the tape, stop uh, the tape. <laughs> stop the tape. Like we're living in 1982. Stop exactly. the tape. <laughs> hey, assistant engineer, stop the tape. Stop, stop the tape. Stop the tape. Oh, yeah, it, awesome. it, you, you kind of have to be like, that was great. So, okay, try right. one more. We're going to keep that. Right. Try one more. This time when you get to such and such and such, I want you to try this. Do this, yeah. Yeah, and I think That's, those you because uh, when you when you when your singer or your artist whoever that is feels really comfortable behind the microphone and with you in that sort of naked emotional state, that's when you're going to get your most honest and your best stuff. So at some point, you got to get them to feel really comfortable and at home and to trust you. You know, that's a big part of producing. Now, listen up, folks. This these are the 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 diamonds. Uh, the diamond parables of production, you know? Yes, yeah. yes. Or, or, yeah. or not parables, but, you know, tips for the sure. Tips. Secret insider stuff. Um, it's very true, very true. And I like something else you said. Produce vocals without any effects and no auto-tune. Auto -tune. So it's really important, again, with modern music, yeah, there's auto-tune being used and that's fine there's lots of effects big delays and reverbs and, and that's fine but start with a dry palette right yeah yeah so you can yeah. really hear the nuances mm -hmm. and, and even i mean i i know vocal producers who make their artists record to just the piano track they don't even let them hear the finished production wow. because they 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 want them to give they, they say, if you can emote over this track, then anything I add on that is going to be gravy. I worked with one, um, I think I was working with James Carmichael. James um, was an older guy at the time. He's from Mississippi, but he produced um, Lionel Richie, all like the big Lionel Richie hits. and um, But just a really great producer, um, old school guy you know he he was around like you say when there was tape <laughs> right right so you know back when <clears throat> uh we don't have nearly the production uh tools that we have now right. but it was similar to where we didn't cut if i remember correctly i don't think we cut with any reverb yes you know yeah. um especially when you're stacking vocals oh yeah 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 you kind of i think it helps to have just a dry signal and to be able to really hear and focus on what's what you're capturing Let's talk about that stacking, you know, doubling mm -hmm. and uh, blending. How you know? Give us yeah. your, your insight yeah. on that. Um, I, I I think the biggest thing with that is paying attention to detail. So, um, a lot of the, the the vocals that I produce, there's lots of nuance. So everybody has to say the last consonant the same, and if there's a sort of blend or a little run or something in the middle or an inflection um, we all have to be saying that you know the same way so that you get the effect of not just we all said the same thing but we all said the same thing the same way that's right that's and right that's sort of the key when it comes to uh when it comes to stacking um especially if you're doing like i do a lot of jazz and gospel and r&b stuff where to me, the intricacies and sort of the uniqueness is in those uh, little nuances and those little differences. So if you're paying attention to them, especially early on in the process, then as you're stacking, um, it's the cumulative effect of the, mm -hmm. the attention that you pay to details early on right. yields the big results down the road. Yeah. So true. I, I love yeah. working with uh, you know, session singers in, in groups right because yes. you, you really get to see wow these you know three to six people know how to sing together and blend 
and yep, stack yep. And, and it's meticulous mm-hmm. and, yes, and like you say yeah. all the little bends and, and and runs and stuff man so mm-hmm. cool yeah and you'll you'll also find that a lot of times when they're groups like that they work together a lot so they right. they develop their own synergy and language and it's like a band almost that's right that's mm-hmm. right yeah well you mm-hmm. mentioned take six earlier that's a perfect example uh, those yeah. guys incredible man yeah. in Incredible. Um, and I live in a city. I live in Huntsville, Alabama now. And uh, they, those guys went to, got together um, at Oakwood University, which is here in Huntsville. And so that's a school that I get to work with a lot. And their tradition of particularly singing is just, I mean, Brian McKnight went there. Yeah. I mean, uh, Clifton Davis went there. Wow. You know, I mean, for those of you who don't know Clifton Davis is, Clifton wrote, um, you and I must make a pact. You da 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 da, but there is love. I'll be there. So great songwriter, um, but yeah. So the tradition of that school is just incredible. So their choral, their choir, it's not uncommon to hear forty kids singing in ten part harmony. It's just like in the water. I know it's crazy, and well, they're, I, like you say, blending. And I always said that about you and and, and the group <laughs> that you work with out there. Every time you introduce me to somebody else new, I'm like, what what happened? Where did they come from? What's it? Oh, you're like Oakwood. I'm like, get right. out of here. <laughs> what are they feeding the students over there? Is there something uh-huh. in the water? You yeah, know, like yeah, it's yeah. incredible. So so the mm-hmm. regimen that they, you know that they go through in their studies must be uh, uh, pretty extensive. <sighs> It is. And also, I think, you know, it becomes a self-perpetuating thing because now they're attracting similar talent. These kids are growing up listening to Take Six. So by the time they're 18, it's no big deal to sing, you know, six or seven part. I mean, they're picking out the, in, you know, the inner voices and so on. Yeah. Um, but we have another friend that I know you've worked with a bunch too, Shalea. Shalea is oh, an gosh, alum. Oh gosh, yeah, Shalea, <laughs> yes. exactly. Case you know, it just point. goes yeah. on. Yeah, it goes yeah. on and on, man. Just great, really, really great um, environment. And and I think what we can take from that is that, you know, musical development, um, it doesn't really happen in a vacuum. Right. You know, um, you know, I I look at the relationship that we have, you and I have, and I have to credit that as being a part of my own development. So, you know, choose great friends, you know, hang out with people who are better than you, better musicians, better producers, um, because it makes you better. Hey, this is John Stoddard, and I'm hanging out with Nomad right here on the Career Musician Podcast. Go behind the scenes with host Nomad to gain inside knowledge of entertainment business from the world's leading musicians, artists, producers, managers, and more. Help us continue to provide you with new and engaging content by getting our ratings up. Please subscribe and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. I just think that's important. You know, one of the disadvantages of the MIDI us ah. production in the box thing i mean there's lots of great advantages to it one of the disadvantages is that we're not as inclined to collaborate in the way that you had to collaborate in the past you so, know like like uh, maurice white couldn't like you know send a lyric across town and be like, hey man put some drums oh. on this <laughs> That's so funny. Okay, okay. So let's stop here for a minute. I just interviewed Mesa Leek, another mutual friend of mine. Okay, ours. right, yeah, right. What, what a beautiful voice and person, right? And right. I, I used that same example. I said, you know, imagine Earth, Wind, and Fire being in the studio with those guys. They weren't right. sending sessions around via a Dropbox or a Pro, you know. Whatever. Right, right, right. Yeah, we transfer yeah. you the files. You know, let Al McKay put some guitars on it. Then we'll bring it over here back to the studio. We'll put some, you know, come on. Yeah. And that's how we work now, and we can get right. really good product. But still, yeah. I agree. Being in the room and going back to your Blackbird sessions, uh, mm-hmm. uh, Blackbird Studios in Nashville, that mm-hmm. was one of the best times I've had uh, working with you because we had mm. the whole. You had yourself, Kirk, Jason Eskridge, uh, yep. uh, Marcus, uh, Ralph, yeah, Marcus uh, Finney on drums, yeah, Ralph, Ralph Lofton on organ, yes, yeah, yes, uh, yes. Braylon Lacey. Yeah, it was Bray- just the band was all there. You were there, yeah, and so, so uh, Javier. Uh, uh, Javier so on, 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 on percussion. percussion. You brought in mm-hmm. horn players. You know, I mean, yeah. just those are the those mm-hmm. are the days. And, and kudos to the yeah. folks who still track like that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, every record is not meant to be tracked that way. No, absolutely. You know, that's right. Right. That's right. Um, but I think that 
we have to acknowledge and honor the fact that you know that's important like i think it would be a shame if we got so technological and if the budgets got so scrunched that every once in a while we didn't still do these these live sessions where you get everybody in the room because there's a it's a different type of synergy that happens when everyone is in the same space that it just it's not going to happen if if you're not all in the same space. So, so different things. I think there's cool things about both, you know, um, like, for example, um, you live in California now. Um, I love the fact that because we have the technology, if I want you to be a part of a project, I still have a way for you to be a part. Right. It's not like all or nothing. Right. But like you say, there was something extra special about mm-hmm. the Blackbird session where we're in the room feeding off one another in the moment, That's you right. know, getting able to react, listening to a take and being able to react in the moment, make changes. Uh, right. There's something kind of cool about that, too, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I have uh, a good buddy of mine out here. He's a piano player. Um, and he reminds me of you a lot younger version but you know you guys are very similar and um younger that was so rude i can't believe i said that <laughs> jeez <laughs> younger version younger what am, version I'm such of a jerk. Me. i can't believe i just dissed listen, you listen listen oh, I, 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 that st- was so unintentional <laughs> I I, re- I remember the day I had to take the word young out of my bio. It was just like, that was the day I, I had to like. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm guilty too. It's not my right. bio anymore. Either. But what I meant was. <laughs> anyway, we, we always talk about the, the legalistic uh, differences in, in writing music. And here's my point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For some reason, piano players, you guys often think in polychords. Because right. you can play a triad with your left hand, a triad with your right hand, and now all of mm-hmm. a sudden you have this beautiful extension mm-hmm. chord, right? Guitar right. players don't have that luxury. So if I say D minor 11, I simply mean a D minor 11. D minor 11. Mm-hmm. You guys would be like, yeah, but wait a minute. Because if I play DFA in the left, mm-hmm. and then I put a C and a B mashed together, mm-hmm. and I put an mm-hmm. F and an E mashed together and an A on top, now, okay, geez, I played an, an F triad with a D minor triad with a C sus triad. And I'm like, wait, a, you know, so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I love that because then we go back and forth. No, 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 it should be named this. No, it should be named this. No, you should write it like this. (laughs) Theory nerds. Yeah, theory theory, wars. Theory geeking, right? (laughs) You and I always had that because you would send me charts and say, John, when you when you write this D, but but, and the slash and the other, don't you just mean this? And you go, oh, that could work. <laughs> well, I'll take or you even versa. further. I'll take you even further. So, you know, we talked about Kirk Whalem, who I work with a lot. He's an excellent musician and right, he studies theory and so on. Yeah, yeah. So the way he spells stuff is uh, completely different again because he plays saxophone. Player, so he's that's yeah, right. so he's he's or he's thinking about what scale he's gonna play over top of. Yes. It. So he's he he may write something completely different than than either you or I would write. So so true. It just depends. Yeah, it just and depends. The reason why I brought that up because being in the studio with you guys back in the early two thousands and for for at least a decade and a half or so, we were mm-hmm. in and out of the studio together all the time. Mm-hmm. We would have these discussions, and those discussions promote growth right. on, on all parts. Right? It's because mm-hmm. you just it's a, it's an awareness, a new perspective that maybe you didn't think of. Exactly. And, and as an arranger and orchestrator, I think and composer, instrumentalist, what have you, it's so important to have those different yeah. perspectives. Yeah. So. And I also think one of the ways that it helps me to have those conversations, for example, with you as a guitar player, is that, you know, for example, I'm MDing a show and, you know, we only have two days of rehearsal to, to do 20 songs. Right. If I can get a sense of how a guitar player might think about yes. something, then I can communicate in a way that doesn't geek out theory wise, but that communicates what I'm looking for in a way that I'm not going to have to do a lot of explanation. So there's a lot of great value to understanding these different perspectives, because as a communicator, music director or producer, you can communicate in a way that really gets you the you know what you're looking for from the people that you're working with, as opposed to trying to, well, no, that chord is not a G minor seven flat 13. It right. is a, you know, it's like, what, whatever, man. If you were in theory right. class, it makes a difference. But, you know, it, we got to play this show in 20 minutes. And I, you know, if, if I write it this way, he's going to play the chord I want, you know? <laughs> it's funny because you say flat 13, I would think sharp five. 
right? See, exactly. So that's but, a great example. But if you're saying flat 13, then you're implying that the five is natural. Because there's a one three five uh, I got you. I with got a you. dominant okay. seventh okay. and plus a flat thirteen. So the, it it depends on how you voice there's it a, and what you're there, thinking. There's a, yeah. <laughs> there's there's nuance to that, but again, yeah. especially having worked with you long enough, I'm like, okay, I think I'm gonna write it this way because I think that's gonna give him a right. better idea of what I want. Or if it doesn't matter, right. I may say C over, you know, C minor over D. Ah. And call it and call it a day, you know what I mean? Or or yes. or or D plus over D. So you know true. what I mean? <laughs> yeah, or if it's a thirteen flat nine, oftentimes I'll think, well, that's an E triad with kind of like a G seven chord. Oh, okay. Exactly. Yeah, right? yeah exactly. Oh, well so that's different, you know, totally. <laughs> yeah. So and it's a great I, I, I love those kind of discussions again because it takes my education out of the classroom and, 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 and makes it work in the real world. You know what yeah. I mean? And it's, it, it helps to have the education because when someone says, oh, no, I hear it this way, then it helps me with the processing. But um, I, I just think at the end of the day, language is for communicating. That's you know, right. and so if you can kind of make that your goal, how can I communicate this you know, right. in, a, in a way that the person on the other end is going to get it? then you, you save yourself a lot of headache, I think. And then at the end of the day, when you perform, mm -hmm. it takes your performance to the next level. Yeah. Because yeah. now you no longer need words and you really understand mm -hmm. one another, right? Yeah, we, we've taken it out of the word or even the paper right. and we've turned it into music. You know, we're making music yeah. now. Yeah. It's the muse, yeah. 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 yeah, it's the music, you know what I mean? Yeah. I love that, I love that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. All mm -hmm. right, shifting gears, um, talk a little bit about, look, you know, we've, you and I have been in the business about the same amount of time. I think that mm -hmm. 12, 13 is the sweet spot when we all, that bug bites right, us right, and right, we right. get serious, yeah, exactly. you know? <laughs> uh -huh. um, And like, we're around the same age, like I me we mentioned, it takes a lot to be in the business this long successfully, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Talk mm -hmm. about some of the business, uh, you know, principles and, and methods that you've adhered to, or, you know, just, yeah. you know, how do you, how do you approach that? I, I think it's a lot of it is is uh, I have to credit home training for, you know, mm -hmm. um, like stuff like being on time, ah. you know, or being early, you know, um, being prepared. That's right. You know, um, things like um, over over delivering, you know, <laughs> if something needs to be done, you just kind of go ahead and do it, you know, because you're most interested in kind of the whole thing presenting well that's important to you as opposed to hey i look good regardless of or sound great regardless of how anyone else sounds that's right um so those are th being like just polite and nice to people you know i mean it's really just a lot of those things I common think sense kind of things yeah really just home training um you know if the musician behind you has you know hands full of four things and you only have one and you can hold the door for them hold the door for them oh, man I, oh, <laughs> I can't tell you how many times the door's been shut on me my hands are falling I'm like you're really like, guys really you're right you're right you know <laughs> what i mean I, I think i think those types of things because you know so much of music is is what happens you know what i call in between the notes ah oh. and you know and i mean that literally you know the notes music what's happening on stage or in the studio but i think also relationally you know right. um when you're working with people i just think you get better stuff if the people you're working with like you and you like them and you know yeah. you're not going to be best friends with everybody but mm -hmm. you know if you can create a type of work environment that people like working with you trust me you'll, you'll get called back that's right. You get callbacks. Yeah. And that is the goal. We want the callbacks. You want the callbacks. That's it. You want the callbacks, yeah. And you'll get recommendations, not just callbacks, mm -hmm. but you'll, hey, you know, if you need such and such, you need to call that guy or that girl because they are going to be there on time. Right. They're going to do what needs to be done. They do great work. Their sound is great. You know, they, they look presentable when they show up. You know, oh. they're paying attention to the gig. You know, it's just the, the little things that you wouldn't think make a big difference. Um, they do. They do, just relationally. Absolutely. Man, so true. All right. So any memorable moments? Anything funny, ridiculous, crazy, outlandish, nerve-wracking? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I well, know I have well, lots of nerve-wracking yeah, yeah, ones. Yeah, probably lots of ones. Uh, <laughs> Well, I'll give you one that jumps out at me. This was um, 
my first gig with Kirk. So he and I met, we were being courted by Warner Brothers at the same time. Warner Jazz, there was a, an A&R VP guy I who remember had, that. Her, you remember that, right? Yes, so, yes. So Kirk had just left uh, I, Columbia, I think it was, Sony Columbia. And so he was in between deals and the VP had met me through a mutual producer friend who was a staff producer. So he introduced Kirk and I. So, you know, he, I'd done a, a record in my basement that he dug, you know, that Kirk dug. And so that's how we met. But he called me to do this gig with him. It was a gig at a church in Illinois, not, not, not far from Chicago. And it was a duo gig. So it's just saxophone and piano. So really exposed, really naked, right? right so I'm right. here with this like, you know, world renowned saxophone player and I'm, you know, playing the piano, but it was a beautiful piano. It was like a nine foot Baldwin or something. Just really great performance situation. So we're playing this song, and the song's in E-flat. It's an old hymn called Great Is Thy Faithfulness. Ah, so right. we get to the end, and there's a tag. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. That's an E-flat over a B-flat chord, okay? Lord unto B-flat, five chord. And most people would think that the next group, Lord unto me, that's the one, right? So we're about to go back to one. So he holds out that five chord, and we're holding it out. And I'm waiting to play the one chord. And instead of playing an E flat, he plays an E natural. <laughs> and I kind of went, oh! oh, yikes. So in that moment, yeah. I had to come up with a way, like on purpose. Like he yes. was like throwing me right. a curveball, like, oh, okay, yeah. let me see what you got. So I had to come up with a way to make his E natural sound like, hey, that's what we meant to do, and just sort of make it work. So, so like, and so I did. I, I don't know how good it was, but, you know, I, I rolled with it and kind of made that moment happen. And he's been calling me for the past 20 years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I was say, OK, first of all, let's pause there for a minute, because you guys, when you play together, it's ridiculous. It sounds like the same person playing horn and piano at the same time. That's wow. how in, in tune wow. you guys are. You know, this, this is, uh, uh, you know, you're at a whole nother level. But let's talk about options. Let's get a little bit more of that theory nerd. Okay. Right away, I thought if that happened to me, I would play an F minor, F minor nine, minor major nine. So the E would minor, be the major. Ah, got you, got you, got so you. I would okay. play an F okay. minor major nine. Okay. And then I might okay. go to a B flat nine sharp 13, right? I mean, a uh, sharp okay. 11 to keep okay. that E in there, right? Okay, 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 so, got you. Uh -huh. so, or you can uh -huh. play a, a, a C with a B flat in the bass, very similar. Right, 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 right. right. And uh -huh. then you can bring it back to an E flat 6, 9 or something to smooth it out. Or, or got you, got you, right? got you. That's how I would think of it right away. Right, right, right. How do you interpret it? What did you do? Or what would you do? I don't even remember what I did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I probably played, man, I don't remember what I did, but yeah. I just sort of, it's amazing I, I, whatever you I did. Think, yeah, I think like an arranger, like I'm always arranging. Yeah. And that's actually a really difficult, like if he had done an yes. F or something, I mean like. Much e, easier, right. Yeah, yeah. it's like. Um, well, the flat nine, he chose, I mean, he chose the, the sharp nine. like The sharp yikes. nine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, flat, no, he flat chose nine. the flat yeah. nine. I had flat it right nine. the first yeah, time, the flat or nine. flat two or whatever. Or flat so two, it's I just, mean, that's like, wow. That's it's heavy. a really hard, yeah. So I, I don't even remember what I did, but whatever I did, he apparently liked it. You know, um, I, I feel like I did something like maybe an F major seven. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I would say F major you know nine too, I mean? right? Yeah. Yeah, F major kind of. I, oh. I feel like that's probably what I did. See, that's cool. either that, major either seven. that, or I went to a E major nine ah. chord. E major nine, because the other thing about that, you kind of talked about it a little bit when you talked about the. Um, the B flat with the sharp 11. Yeah. So imagine like an E six, nine with the flat five kind of a thing. There you go. Ooh. You wow. know what I mean? Yeah. An so, E six, nine. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that, yeah. All you kinds of little mean? tones. In yeah. There. yeah. Or an E major nine with the flat yeah. five, you know, flat kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. yeah. and that still feels like a five chord yeah. in that context. 
sure does. You know what I mean? Yeah. So see, yeah. So I don't know. I mean, so I think cool. the point is is being prepared and having vocabulary. That's right. That you can like when a moment like that comes up, and I mean, you know, the chances of that happening again are probably slim. I mean, he did it intentionally to kind of see what would happen. Right. Um, but the idea was that we talked about being prepared, and those are the things that we study and you geek out about. You know. Uh, your theory and understanding how music and coming up with different ways to voice things or get from one place to another. Like, when am I ever going to use that? You never know. Never. Oh. You never know. Look at that. You take that from Greg Fillingains. He says that all the time. <laughs> you never know. You never he would always know. say to me, you never know, Rapol. You never know. I'm like, thanks, Greg. Thanks, Greg. That means you're going to keep my number in your phone. Great. Exactly. You. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, and I, think, I think headroom, we call it headroom, is a yeah. beautiful thing. I mean, not only is it great to have options available to you, but... If I can, if I know how to play a C, a D, an E, an F, a G, an A, and a B, then when I play a C, it's going to sound different than if I only know how to play a C. Ah, good point. So headroom, yeah. So the headroom is not so much that you play every chord you know. Mm -hmm. It's just that when you play the right chord, it feels differently when you had 12 other choices, but you chose this one, as right. opposed to this was the only choice you had available. Right, right. You know what I mean? And that's yes. kind of one of those things that you just, it's hard to measure, Yeah. you know, but you know it when you hear it, you're like, man, uh -huh. that, that was a C chord, but it, but it they, sounds like a, it was a different kind of C than I'm used to hearing. Yeah, yeah because was, they started with the F on top, then an F sharp, then they put the G. Oh, that was yeah, slick. Yeah. Exactly. To do that, exactly. You know, exactly. Some inner mo inner motion, right? You know, inner mm, voice. Or motion. how you how how you get there, how you, how you voice it. it. Yeah. yeah, you know. So all that stuff. You know, if you want to know why you practice, even if you don't think you're ever going to use it, that's why it improves your mm. musicianship and your execution. You know, knowing how to do stuff improves the stuff, even if you don't do the stuff that you learn how to do. Right. It's just something about having that available mm. to you and knowing yeah. when to employ it and when not to. oh come man. on man because those piano players that play a, a, a substitution every beat i just want to throw a <laughs> drumstick at them like, excuse me drummer can i get that stick please you know Listen, like yeah dude drum, come on dr dr drummers too you Dr know, drummers think, too with all the yeah. subdivisions yeah, yeah they, don't they, one of the most iconic drum fills Whitney Houston, I will always love you before the modulation. Ah, uh, one boom. eighth note <laughs> on the snare. Iconic, iconic. <laughs> that's iconic. the drum fill. Yes, that's, that's it. That's fill. it. <laughs> that's yeah. it. And then yeah, Kirk so, played the solo on that. He played the sax. Oh my yeah. goodness! Wow. J wasn't yeah. it J.R. Robinson playing the drums on that? Maybe I don't know. Uh, who played? No, no. Uh, uh, Ricky, Ricky Lawson. Ricky Lawson. Rick, okay. Ricky Minor. Yep. Paul Jackson. That's right. I think uh, Bet Sussman played keys in that band, uh, and um, Wayne Lindsay maybe. Wayne Lindsay, yes, yes. Yeah, Who, I think yeah. Wayne, was either. Wayne was on the show with us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. I mean, we that had band. Wayne, Woo. Ricky, and Kirk, and now you. Look at that. There wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, those that band was. Whew. Yeah, they just uh, knew how to play the right notes. I mean, um, you know, what a lot of people don't know about that we talk about. What I will always love you is that record, that particular song was one take recorded straight to two track. It wasn't even multi-track. It was a rehearsal. Wow. That that Clive Davis said that's the record. Just they were just yeah. I'm talking Whitney's vocal, everything. Everything was live. The band was off stage. So when you see her sing that song in the movie, she's actually singing it live to that's the film. That's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. And Kirk what talks about how that's like the most uh, played saxophone solo ever or something, you know, like it had the most spins globally for a yep. sax solo. Yeah, you know? for a sax solo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. the most heard or the most yeah, something played like, yeah, saxophone. Yeah, 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 something like that. Yeah, Incredible. So. Just the magic. Mm -hmm. There was magic on that. Definitely. There were, it was a moment. Yeah. It was a moment. Yeah. Um, uh, that goes back to what we talked about is, you know, there's all sorts of ways to produce. Mm -hmm. But man, if, you, if you've never had a chance to do it, Mm. I just encourage, you know, um, it's something that I think is less common these days. Um, but if you ever get a chance to do a session, either be a part of one or sit in a session where there's like 
really great musicians all in a room, like yeah. playing something like yeah. all together at the same time. It's nothing like an orchestra, same oh. way. If you get it, you guys are, you know, you're in LA, those yeah. musicians who are in LA, if you get to sit in on a film session where there's a hundred mm. orchestra players in a room Dude. and you, you get, it, it, it will change your life. The Warner Brothers soundstage is right around the corner from my studio here. I, I anytime I can sit in on a session or be part of it, it's amazing to, like you said, to have a hundred human beings together playing music is just incredible. <laughs> it's incredible, man. I mean, I, and, and not just any musician, like right. the best of the best, you know, the like these class. amazing, yeah. you know, great yeah. composers. It's, right. Wow, it's just wow. You just go yeah. wow. Absolutely, yeah, and and slowly, I think we'll get back to that. Even though you know the pandemic has slowed yeah. everything down, but I, it'll get there eventually, I think. Yeah, I, I would encourage you know I'm, I'm going to emphasize that one more time because I think you know we talked about headroom as mm -hmm. musicians, but as producers and arrangers, um, even if you're mostly doing dance music and it's mm -hmm. all programmed, mm -hmm. um, I think exposing yourself to you know, orchestra music or country music or mm -hmm. whatever, you know, pick, pick something that's different than what you do. Um, it's going to inform and improve that thing that you do because that's, right. you know, that's one of the advantages that we have with YouTube and all these different you know, streaming services. There's so much music um, available to us that we can take advantage of. And again, even if you're not incorporating something specific, Mm. There's just something about exposing yourself to these other types of music, uh, particularly live music, um, that I think it just there's no it can only improve whatever it is you're doing. That's so perfect. I was just going to ask you in, in, in closing, you know, mm. any words of wisdom? And that is th there you go. <laughs> you laid it out. Beautiful. That's a that's Ex a good one. Um, yeah. M music is synergetic and it's relational. Yeah. And um, one of the things that I think, you know, we have to make sure we're intentional about because the technology can make it so that you can sit in a room and make music and like not really interact with other people. Oh, yes. um, that we have to really be intentional about making sure we stay connected, making sure we're challenging ourselves, making sure we're um, um, cultivating and um, continuing to nurture relationships with people who are going to challenge us and push us and make us better. And um, that's a big part of, of what's going to make music, I think, continue to grow and expand for years and years to come so that we can keep enjoying the great music that, uh, that a, a lot of the um, artists and musicians that I've had a chance to hear, you know, just in the music that is out there in the marketplace. Right. We're going to keep getting that great music as we continue to just stay in relationship with one another. So I just want to encourage and affirm that. Ah, I love that. I love that. The human connection. The human right. connection. Of music. Yes. That's what it's about. Yes. That's what it's about. Man, so awesome. All right. So real quick, before we close, do you mind okay. some rapid fire questions? All right. Rapid fire. Here we go. Yeah, here we go. Favorite food? Uh, anything my wife cooks. <laughs> Good answer, John. <laughs> now, I know Helen, and she is the most amazing person in the world, and she's a great cook, but what she's a good a answer. Cook. I would have never yeah. thought to say that. Jeez. <laughs> she's got so many points at home. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> can you give us, can you narrow it down? Do you narrow it down. Style, a culture? Uh, it's uh, Jamaican. I'm half Jamaican, so Jamaican, Jamaican. food. Love that. Food. Okay, yeah, favorite yeah. libation, but I don't think I don't think you drink any alcohol, right? I, I'm not an alcohol person, but I'm a smoothie guy. Ooh. Like really creative smoothies. Yeah, really nice. creative smoothies. I've yeah. been making those every day for my girls and we love them. Yeah. Oh man, so smoothies yeah. are great. They're the best. Fresh nice fruits. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Veggies, throw it on. My, my dad just sent us, he lives in Florida, and he just sent us all these, like, a box of mangoes, like the big uh, ones that when you peel them, you can eat them with a spoon because they're so smooth. Mm. Yeah, so we use those for our smoothies, too. It's, it's, I just made one this morning with fresh mangoes. Yes. Uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, show, show off. Us. You're rubbing, yeah. it, rubbing it in. No, and then, and then you throw, <laughs> what I like to do is throw in some carrots. I, I try to keep oh, the, like, what nice. I learned about juicing is if you keep the colors similar... The, That's the, true. The, the taste profile tends to be more uh, co co cohesive, you know? Yeah, that so makes if you sense. Do that makes carrots sense. and mangoes and an orange, right? Ah, and then if, if you're, you're going to do something with apples, then I would do apples and beets. 
And believe Ooh, that it that sounds good. You think, you think, oh, I don't like beet juice. But yeah, but if you mix it with an apple, it's really it's good. It's amazing. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway, yeah, yeah. these aren't so rapid fire as you see. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Your favorite sport? Basketball. Okay. Okay. Good. Basketball. Yeah. Uh, how do you f- spend your free time, assuming assuming you have any, because you have a wife and family, right, right. And beautiful exactly. daughters, and, and right, music? Right. So, so my latest hobby is I'm learning Spanish on Duolingo. Oh. Sí, sí. Yo aprendo español, amigo. Oh. Hermano mío. Hermano. <laughs> wow. Sí. Okay. So I'm doing the same thing, and I'm, okay. I'm on hiatus right now. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it. How is it that I'm gonna, Kirk... I'm gonna, I know, yeah. right? He speaks Kirk's like 12 school. languages, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we should practice with one another. Yeah, we should. I was going to say, so we'll start texting in Spanish. Love it. Great idea. But yeah, I cheat because I just go to Google Translate. I translate well, and then I bring it back. Well, you do as much as you can. Yeah. And then, you know, for the stuff that you can't. Because even That's looking true. it up on Spanish Dictionary or Google Translate still helps you learn. It does. You're it, for, right. it forces you to kind of, you know what I mean? Exactly. I, I still cheat too, but yeah. I have friends, like I have a, a good buddy fr- who's from Cuba yeah. and we text in Spanish. Ah. Yeah. So, and that helps me. I you know, it's not it. quite, yeah. you know, it's not quite as good as speaking, but yeah. you know, we're working on a project together. Um, Jamie. Nice. Yeah. So oh, he and I, that's we, yeah, right. you remember Jamie, the violinist? Oh, remember, Jamie. Yeah. <laughs> Jaime Jorge, yeah. yes. Jaime Jorge. So we wow. uh, we text um, so, so nosotros mensaje en español. Oh, so. see. <laughs> yes, that's so, our yeah. our our conversations we, in Spanish. We message, we, yeah, we message. We message uh-huh. So the message, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, and what a talented violinist! Oh my gosh, oh, man. yeah, he's great. Yeah, yeah, he's he's great. We're working on a project now, so I, I, I'll be calling. Nice. <laughs> oh wow! So, cool. so cool. all right, uh, do you prefer to drive or be driven? Depends on who's driving. Ooh, good answer. Man, you really thought these out. Did you have time to study this or what, bro? <laughs> uh, so, yeah, my kids are driving now. I have a 16-year-old right. and a 19-year-old. So, um, my 16-year-old uh, probably is the more um, calm driver. Yeah. My 19-year-old, she's a little more frenetic. So uh, uh, I, yeah. I can like be on my phone when my 16-year-old is driving. When the 19-year-olds, I'm kind of watching the road. So it just depends. <laughs> and you, you know what prompts me to ask is because when we're on tour, we're always being driven. But yeah. have you ever ridden with somebody like a tour bus where you like can't sleep because you're like, oh, okay. Oh, just scared. They, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't so like it. Yeah. It, yeah. De- it depends on who's driving. <laughs> and, and the same way with my pilots. I like to get to know my pilots. I go. Oh, talk you go to introduce them. yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hey, Jim, how you doing? Nice to meet you. Because they usually wear name tags. Or I ask them, how you doing? Nice yeah, to meet yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you're flying us today, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. I just wanted to meet you. Say hi. <laughs> Make sure that you know that I know that, you know, I care. I'm back and here. You care. Right? And <laughs> you have a family to get home to. I have a family to get home exactly, to. Exactly. So. <laughs> <like. laughs> uh, okay, what activities oh, do you, funny. speaking of flights, what, what activities do you enjoy on those long flights? Uh, I'm a movie guy. Like I, I catch ah, up on too. movies. I yes. catch up on movies on long flights, and I'm a, I'm an action kind of like, yeah. but like but like not too gory. So like okay. you know Marvel action. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah, you know, or like uh, what did I watch the other day? I watched um, the Bourne movies oh, again. Great. I haven't watched it. Oh. I hadn't watched those in a while. So like stuff like that. Yeah, yeah and John Powell scored those. Ah, oh, that's yeah. right. He yes. did. Yes. That's yes. right. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. And I like animated stuff too. Any anything that's got a great you know soundtrack to it. You know, I was just gonna D- say Disney when you're stuff. watching those movies, do you get distracted by the score or do you do a couple passes? One score li- listen. Yeah, one movie yeah. watch. You know. <laughs> Um, I don't. I can watch the movie. I'm not distracted by the score. Yeah. But when something jumps out at me while I'm watching, I really take note. There you go. Yeah. Same here. So sometimes there's stuff that's like, okay, whatever's going on in that score is is really amazing. So there you I, go. I, it, like it has to pull my attention to listen in that way. That's right. That's you right. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah. In, in, in a good way, not distracting, but I'm like, oh, wow, that was cool. And then I, you might rewind and listen. I was to just going to say, I've hit the pause button, <laughs> grabbed the guitar while my wife is sitting on the couch uh, with the popcorn. And I'm like, sorry, babe, I got to figure this out. I got to find out what the, what the heck that composer did. Oh, I see what they did. Okay, now I got it. Okay, babe, we can continue. We can keep going. <laughs> 
We're such uh, music musicians. People yeah. think musicians are cool. We're the biggest, biggest geeks, nerds, yeah. nerds in the world. We are exactly. All right. All right. What's the latest <laughs> song, band, artist, any kind of music that you've listened to recently that you uh, didn't work on? That okay. You had okay. No, so, no involvement. The other day, I started listening to the Brandy record. The newest Brandy record. The newest Brandy record. Okay. The, the latest Brandy just came uh, out. I haven't even and checked it out. And get this. This is something that, for whatever reason, I pulled out the Waiting to Exhale soundtrack. Okay. That your former wow. boss That's produced. Right. Yeah, Babyface yeah. produced a lot of that. So I listened to that. And it seemed like there was... Oh, and was the... Great um, And the other soundtrack I listened to was the Love Jones soundtrack the other day. Oh, so wow. those were the... Yeah, like, just this week, I'm not a big, like go back and listen to music guys but for whatever reason those those records well, came up and I, I pulled them up and listened to them those three records had a 90s theme right there exactly you, you were oh, in a 90s true. mood yeah I was in a 90s space yeah. apparently interesting yeah. very cool very yeah cool. so maybe emotionally I, I wanted to go back <laughs> <laughs> that's funny uh, are you reading anything right now that you're enjoying so I am. I'm reading this really, really. It's it's like a two thousand page book. I don't know. This is gonna make me sound like really smart, much smarter than I really am. <laughs> but a friend of mine turned me onto this book about the spirit, like the human spirit, uh-huh. um, by this um, Chinese theologian wow. called I don't even remember the name. Um, I have to look it up, but. Let me see it while we're while we're talking. Let me see if I can find it. Absolutely, um, that sounds interesting. But yeah, so that's yeah. But it's like two thousand pages, and I've been working my. It's called the Spiritual Man, and the the uh, author is a guy named Watchman Nee N E E Watchman Nee. So wow. that's what I'm. And again, I'm I'm not like a huge book reader, but I've been kind of working my way through that book over the past maybe month and a half maybe well wow, very month cool i'm, I'm yeah. looking it up now he's born in 1903 passed in yeah. 1972 the year i was born actually okay mm-hmm, interesting mm-hmm, wow mm-hmm. yeah I'll yeah check so. that out love that yeah. uh shopping you already gave it away zara which i love that store by the way so right, you prefer right, right. brick and mortar uh yeah i think i prefer brick and mortar i'm not a big shopper right but i guess if i had to choose i would probably choose brick and mortar which comes as a huge surprise every since i've known you for the past years Uh every time i've seen you you are dressed to the nines (laughs) i always said john should be a model a model Uh, and a musician like a gq model musician yeah Yeah. you're always Uh, dressed to the nines i love your i love your sense of fashion man Okay, so little known fact about, you know, maybe you probably didn't even know this, but for a while I was into fashion design, like designing. I did not know and, that, but it makes yeah, sense and, now. And so my college sweetheart, one year for Christmas, we, uh, my sister threw a New Year's Eve party every year. And one year for Christmas, I designed my girlfriend's like New Year's Eve outfit, and that was her Christmas present. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah, so, yeah, I don't Very get cool. to do it anymore, but I was into yeah. it for a while. So that kind of where my love for fashion, you know, now I'm a dad and I've got kids and I'm a yeah. poor musician yeah. with a, like a mortgage <laughs> and stuff. So <laughs> I don't get to go shopping anymore. They, well, they spend it all on their wardrobe. They spend it all. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. They, they look good. I just yeah. look good through Makes, them. <laughs> Makes perfect sense. All right. You've collaborated with a lot of greats, but do you have any dream okay. collaborations that haven't happened yet? Yeah. Yes, dream collaborations, uh, David Foster, ah. um, Quincy Jones, Sting, ah. um, B.B. Winans. Nice. Although I'm not sure I got to p- perform with him, so I guess that kind of is a collaboration. Um, and probably um, Hans Zimmer ah. um, and John Williams, the two film composers. So I've had, I, I don't know if I was allowed six people, but. Yeah, the, there, there you have it. As many as you want. And I usually add it could be dead or living. It's cool. You know, oh, it's, man. Yeah. Well, I'm glad know, you then, didn't tell me that. We will be then. here forever. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. John, this has yeah. been amazing. Listen, last question. Okay. What would you do, although I think you just kind of gave it away, what would you do <laughs> if you weren't a career musician? Uh, for a living, maybe an architect. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah. See, I, architect. I, I, that parallel I find common. Design, uh-huh. architecture, yeah. mm-hmm. music. Maybe graphic artist or something Graf- like that. Yes. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Makes perfect Creating. sense. Creating. Yeah, I like building. I was a Lego guy growing up. You know, I love yeah. Legos. So, yeah, and yeah, I love sense. surfaces and textiles and textures, oh, right? Oh, interesting. Okay. Like, like, I'm the guy who walks into a really cool new restaurant and, and rubs my hand on the wall. I'm like, wow, wow that's, not, that's a nice texture, you know? Like, Interesting. Yeah, I didn't yeah. know that about you. So would you do textiles or like fabrics or would you I do think, fashion design? Or? Uh, not fashion. Uh, I don't think I have the eye quite for that, but I think it would be more uh, interior design. Interior design. Oh, I can see that. Okay, yeah. got you. Ah, uh, oh, I can see that. So you okay, could design the building and I'll design the interior. And you do the interior. There, there we go. go. Right. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> I'll send you a proposal by the end of the week. Oh, great. (laughs) (laughs) This has been awesome. Thank you so much, man. Man, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I think the podcast is uh, awesome. So much great information. Um, So many great guests. Uh, I've learned a lot from the episodes that I've got a chance to to check out. So thank you for having me on and giving me an opportunity to share. Ah, beautiful. Man, you're the Mm -hmm. man, brother. (laughs) Thanks, man. Binge previous seasons of the Career Musician Podcast and subscribe for all new episodes. Follow the Career Musician at Facebook, Instagram, and sign up for the Career Musician newsletter at thecareermusician.com. I'm just a nomad, nowhere man. Writing the songs in this one man band. I know me This is Nomad, host and creator of the Career Musician Podcast, and I am thoroughly stoked to be an official member of the Pantheon Podcast Network. Pantheon Podcast Network is the first of its kind as an all-music-based podcast collective. Please be sure to check us out at pantheonpodcast.com for more info.